OK, welcome everyone to this week's uh, Energy Futures Lab lunchtime webinar. My name is Conor McNally. I'm the Communications Manager at the Institute, and I'm very pleased to introduce this week's um, speaker, Dr. Alistair Hales from the Department of Mechanical Engineering here at Imperial. Um, Alistair has a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Bristol, and before joining Imperial in 2018, he worked at Suez Advanced Solutions and as a research associate uh, at Queen Mary University of London. Alistair's current research looks at thermal management and thermal effects of lithium ion cells. He led the work introducing the cell cooling co coefficient as a universal metric to quantify battery thermal performance. And he's now building on that research to develop capability for cell design optimization. So Alistair is going to speak to us for about 30 minutes um, and then he'll take your questions. To submit a question, use the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. And as always, uh, do put your name and affiliation with that um, question. Um, and Alistair will get to as many as those um, as he can after about half 12. So with that, I will hand over now to Alistair. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and tuning in today. Uh, I, as I said, I'm Alistair Hales. I'm a research associate based in the Electrochemical Science and Engineering Group at Imperial College London. And I've been part of the group just over two years. My primary area of research is effects of temperature on lithium ion cell performance. Specifically, I'm very, very interested at the moment in how we can improve cell design uh, to support uh, more effective thermal management. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about lithium ion cell design and how it impacts thermal management in applications. So I'll begin with a bit of background on the topic area, explaining why temperature effects are so important and the challenges faced by industry today. I'll briefly review the existing thermal management methods before focusing on how we can assess the thermal performance of lithium ion cells. Um, as a group of colleagues, we have proposed a metric for thermal performance termed the cell cooling coefficient. I will introduce the concept for this metric before looking into its use in application how it can be used to inform lithium ion cell design in the future. Um, and yeah, finally, uh, I think uh, it is reasonably well established that lithium ion batteries present a very promising solution for decarbonizing our transport network. Uh, but the shift towards EV dominated future, uh, there's still plenty that the industry is doing wrong. And I'm going to present my outlook on the state of the industry and what needs to change to justify the phenomenal growth predictions that have been made. So first, some background. Um, heat generation occurs in any lithium ion cell. It is dependent on many operational characteristics and is highly nonlinear. Operational temperature, the rate at which the cell is being charged or discharged, the cell's state of charge or the cell's state of health will all impact instantaneous rate of heat generation. Uh, and you can see in the graph here that um, you have very nonlinear heat generation over the course of a simple constant current charge or discharge of a cell. Um, and this matters because temperature gradients are induced in the cell as the cells generate heat and as they reject heat from their volume. And temperature gradients lead to unequal current flow in a cell, which can accelerate degradation. A key aim in the design and use of any cell should be to minimize the temperature gradients incurred across it. This will maximize the performance of the cell and the lifetime. Cell temperature gradients are just the start. An electric vehicle battery pack contains hundreds or thousands of individual lithium ion cells, and the problem therefore gains another degree of complexity. Cell to cell temperature gradients are just as important, and the private sector is investing an enormous amount in trying to optimize the removal of heat from battery packs effectively. The problem is the battery industry as a whole cannot agree on the best method for achieving effective heat removal. Cell manufacturers cannot agree on the best shape for lithium ion cell. We have small cylindrical cells and enormous pouch and prismatic cells today available on the market. Uh, and at the same time, pack designers are unable to agree on the best thermal management method. We have air cooling, liquid cooling, immersion cooling, and the use of phase change materials, which are becoming particularly popular, especially in academia. We also have seven time cooling loops from Tesla, which is shown here in the bottom left hand side and a number of modular designs uh, from European OEMs, which will be released over the course of the next 18 months. 
Uh, BYD, a market leader in China, just patented a blade cell, which will be the entire width of a car. There is no way that each set of designers could be given the same set of information about effective lithium ion cell thermal management and end up with such dramatically different conclusions. Our conclusion from this is that there's a lack of information available on effective thermal management and no tools available to help with design innovation. And as a result, the industry is trapped. I expect designers select cells based on the performance metrics available to them. There is no metric which defines the thermal management capability, and so they end up choosing cells with the best energy density. And so cell manufacturers maximize energy density to remain competitive in the market. This is a problem for thermal performance because active material is thermally insulating. Temperature gains and therefore degradation will be greater in an energy dense cell. Batch track designers attempt to combat the problem with very over-engineered thermal management solutions. Um, these are heavy and they demand lots of power. So for example, in the Tesla Model 3, which is probably the, one of the most advanced batch packs on the road today, only 64% of its mass is lithium ion cells. The thermal management system makes up most of the remaining mass. So at cell level, we may have optimized energy density, which is great, but at pack level, we certainly do not. So how do we move away from suboptimal thermal management? If you look at a cell data sheet today, you'll find information on cell density, which is given universally across the battery industry in watt hours per kilogram. You'll also find information on power capability, given as a maximum continuous charge or discharge rate and potentially a pulse discharge or charge rate, but you won't find any information on thermal performance. And this presents a real problem to the engineer who's attempting to design the thermal management system. What we have proposed um, in a couple of papers recently is inclusion of thermal performance metrics on data sheets in the future. This requires a universal measure of cells capability to reject heat. And we will believe we will better arm the batch pack designer with information to optimize the design of a thermal management solution. In time, what we have termed the cell cooling coefficient can become a metric for cell designers to enhance and a standard against which all cells can be compared. So for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to focus on power cells, which are probably the simplest of the cell form factors in terms of assembly. And so I'll quickly lead through just a bit of an introduction. Central to a power cell is the electrode stack, which can be thought of as a sandwich stack of individual layers. An individual layer consists of current collectors, electrodes, the anode and the cathode, and a separator, which holds the electrolyte. The current collectors, as the name suggests, carry current away from the electrodes to the cell terminals, which are the tabs. And this is shown in the sketches I've got included here. Every cell has a positive or negative tab. They can be opposing ends of the cell, such as the cell in the top right hand corner, sorry, top left hand corner, uh, or they can be very small and very close to one another, as, as with the cell below it. The tabs allow the user to make the electrical connections to the power cell from the any external devices. Power cells can be cooled through their tabs, but surface cooling dominates in the battery industry today. Surface cooling is attractive because pouch cells have very large flat surfaces. You can implement your thermal management method uniformly across the surface of the cell. As a result, surface cooling is highly effective for bulk heat removal from the cell. But the problem is the direction of heat transfer in the cell when you are surface cooling, as it leads to temperature gradients between each layer of the cell. In turn, this causes significant layer-to-layer -layer current in homogeneities, which means the layers behave differently from one another in operation. As we know, this leads to accelerated degradation in the cell. Tab cooling can solve these problems because heat is instead removed along the layers of the cell. The current collectors, typically copper and aluminium, which are very thermally conductive, act as effect effective heat rejection pathways. So with tab cooling, we eliminate layer to layer inhomogeneities, which cannot escape, which we cannot escape with surface cooling, and each layer behaves the same. The problem is the amount of heat that can, remove, can be removed through the tabs. Tabs are often very small and simply don't allow a sufficient rate of heat transfer from the cell in operation. There are a significant thermal bottleneck in many cell designs that are available today.
The benefits of tab calling, when tab calling can be implemented, are considerable. A former, a former member of the um, electrochemical group uh, at Imperial College led an investigation on a cell that was designed to be tab called. And so what he did, and there is a YouTube video available, which uh, I highly recommend people go and watch. It's had about 40,000 views, so the link is here, um, and I'm sure we can share it afterwards. Um, and what was shown is that when you compared surface cooling to tab cooling, the lifetime of the cell that was tab cooled was tripled compared to the one that was surface cooled. Um, this highlights that the benefits of tab cooling can increase the ceiling on potential lifetime of a cell, whereas surface cooling appears in this case to always be trapped by the limitations fundamental to the direction of heat transfer. And so just going to quickly introduce two example cells. Cell A, which is actually the cell used in the study I discussed on the previous slide, has large tabs located at opposing ends of the cell. Tabs are also quite big compared to the size of the cell. All round, it qualitatively appears to suit tab cooling. Cell B, meanwhile, is picked to demonstrate a cell that is absolutely not designed for tab cooling. The tabs are very small and right next to one another. It appears very unsuitable for tab cooling. The problem is, at the moment, I can't tell you any more than this. We have no way of actually quantifying how well either cell will perform in a surface cooled or tab cooled environment. Every one of the parameters shown in these two tables would have a part to play. Often cell disassembly and many characterization experiments would be required to populate such tables. It is no surprise that thermal performance is often ignored in batch pipe design. Cell cooling coefficient is designed to try and solve this problem. What we really need to know is what temperature gradient would be required across our cells to remove a certain amount of heat. And so the cell cooling coefficient is designed to provide exactly this information. We provide the rate of heat rejection from the cell by the temperature gradient occurring across the cell. And we believe the cell cooling coefficient can become a tool to estimate the rate of heat rejection for a given thermal gradient, a constant for a particular cell and surface to be managed, a metric against which any two cells may be compared, and a standard for competition improvement in the future. The cell cooling coefficient is empirically derived. This demonstrates one of its key benefits over other established methods for defining thermal performance. For example, the beer number or thermal conductance require knowledge of material properties. Cell manufacturers are not likely to divulge this information. And so anyone looking to approximate cell thermal performance through such metrics will need to disassemble the cell. Other thermal performance metrics have been borrowed from other areas of engineering, but the beer number and thermal conductance actually define a body's capability to transfer heat from one point to another. This isn't at all relevant for a device that is generating heat throughout its volume, such as an electric chemical or lithium ion cell. The image shows the apparatus surrounding the cell, which we use to determine the cell cooling coefficient for tap cooling. The apparatus shown is actually encased in insulation during a test to eliminate loss through all unwanted heat rejection pathways. Heat is passed from the cell through the tabs and along each of the brass bus bars to the heat sinks of the conductive system. Heat rate along the bus bars, labelled Q.neg and Q.positive here, is measured by a temperature gradient along the bus bar. The temperature gradient in the cell, relevant to the cell cooling coefficient, is that from the maximum temperature, in this case, found in the center of the cell to the respective cell tabs. This was also recorded. The system must be in a steady temperature state when the cell cooling coefficient is determined, i.e. there is no temperature change occurring with respect to time. This is achieved by generating a constant amount of heat in the cell for a long period of time, and we did this using a square wave profile centered around zero amps in our drive cycle. Therefore, the cell state of charge will not change with time. The eventual cell cooling coefficient calculation is simple as shown. 
The apparatus is similar in concept when deriving the surface cell cooling coefficient. This time we have a cooling plate mounted to the top surface of the cell and we monitor heat rejection through the temperature gradient along each of the fins labeled QF1 to QF4. This time the relevant temperature gradient across the cell is from the bottom uncooled surface to the top surface. We did need all of this information before we could try to quantify the thermal performance of our two cells. Using the cell cooling coefficient, we can have a good approximation of the cell thermal performance with just this information, which is much more likely to fit onto a data sheet in the future and can be derived without any knowledge of the cell's internal composition and properties. So, how does the cell cooling coefficient actually get used in application? Here I walk through a simple worked example where we are aiming to design a 15 amp hour battery pack that must be capable of a 4C discharge. Therefore, we would need either three cell A's, as each has a capacity of 5 amp hours, or two cell B's, say over 7.5 amp hour capacity. Both cells are capable of a 4C discharge according to the spec sheets that are available. So our data sheet of the future would also have information about thermal performance. Using this information, we can look at how the cells would expect to perform in our battery pack. We just need some simple heat rates, which are displayed here. It was found that cell A generates just under 5 watts of heat during a 4C discharge, while cell B generates 8.28 watts of heat. And so by rearranging the cell cooling coefficient equation, which I introduced a couple of slides earlier, we find that cell A would incur a 15 degree temperature gradient across its volume if it was tab cooled, or a five degree temperature gradient if it was surface cooled. Cell B, meanwhile, would incur a 40 degrees temperature gradient if tab cooled, but this would be reduced as four degrees if surface cooled. It's clear from this information that cell B, as we know, surface cooling is the only viable option. 40 degree temperature gradient would be unsafe and require coolant held significantly below the ambient temperature. For cell A, the designer of the thermal management system has to weigh out the benefits of reduced temperature associated with surface cooling and compare it to the favorable temperature gradient when the cell is tab cooled. The takeaway message is that the cell designer is much better informed either way. They have quantities to work with and this would allow them to improve cell selection during the initial batch pack design stage and improve batch pack operation over its lifetime. Cell cooling coefficient can also be used to quickly compare lots of different cells. Any cell from man any manufacturer can be included on a graph such as I have included on the right hand side here. I've plotted four cell cooling co coefficients for four different cells on each axis. We have the surface cell cooling coefficient on the vertical axis and CCC tabs on the horizontal. From this we can have a look at how to approximate how surface cooling and tab cooling compare to each other, to one another. In the future, we hope to be able to use a graph of this concept to define thermal management approach, to define which thermal management approach would be best. Experiments are ongoing, but we're not there just yet. Evaluating the performance of existing cells is one thing, but the reality is that cells are designed with a certain thermal management method in mind. There's no point suggesting tab cooling for the vast majority of power cells available today. The tabs are inadequate, represent massive thermal bottlenecks, and the method will never be effective. The aim is to make industry realise that tab cooling can be achieved, and the cell cooling coefficient is fundamental to quantifying the benefits of cell redesign in this manner. In a recent study, we looked at the tab cell cooling coefficient for a number of different cell models. Each cell model was similar, except for the number of layers in the electrode stack, represented on the x-axis on this graph. Variation on the number of layers isn't what I'm going to focus on here. Actually, what we found with these five cell models is that two of them, the 3.2 amp power cell and the 4 amp power cell, had thinner tabs than the other three. 
differences are shown in the table on the bottom left hand side. The effect of energy density is shown in the table on the bottom right hand side. By increasing the thickness of the tabs, we reduce the energy density by less than 1% at the cell level. The benefit in terms of thermal performance is substantial, as we have shown through our predictions on the graph. We calculate that the tab cell cooling coefficient would be increased by 20% for the 3.2 amp hour cell and by 17% for the 4 amp hour cell if thicker tabs are selected. So, for a 0.7% reduction in cell level energy density, we increase the thermal performance by 20%, which isn't a bad payoff. Comes back to optimization of the pack level energy density, not the cell level energy density. With an improvement like this to cell level thermal performance, it's likely that the pack thermal management system could be simplified and its mass reduced. A link between the cell cooling coefficient and degradation rate would massively increase the applicability of the metric. We have compared the results from two degradation studies, one on a large pouch cell and the second on a small pouch cell, the same study I discussed in the background um, for this webinar. In both cases, tab cooling was directly compared to surface cooling as the cells were cycled across their full voltage window at 20% of their manufactured limited discharge rate. Because the cells are of different capacity, we've attempted to normalize the results by dividing the cell cooling coefficients of each cell and the degradation rates by their beginning of life capacity. The graph shows the results, and we have drawn lines between the two tab cooling data points and the two surface cooling data points. The tab cooling data suggests that degradation rate can be drastically reduced by improving the tab cell cooling coefficient. The surface cooling degradation rate may also be reduced by improving the surface cell cooling coefficient, but the return of the benefits is less, highlighted by the lesser gradient on the line. These results are not sufficient, of course, to draw quantitative conclusions. The presented axis require further population of lots more data, and we are currently on our way to uh, trying to do this. What is clear, however, is that the tab cell cooling coefficient does not need to compete in terms of magnitude with the surface cell cooling coefficient. Tab cooling can be the best method for elongating the lifetime of a cell, even when, tab cell, even when the tab cell cooling coefficient is substantially smaller. The key is to reach that threshold through redesign of the cell where tab cooling is applicable and where sufficient heat can be removed from the cell. The study is summarized here highlights that tab cooling isn't just for small 5 amp hour pouch cells. My colleague Yan led a numerical study on a large 50 amp hour pouch cell. Yan took the design of an LG chem cell and increased the thickness of the tabs in his model from 0.2 millimeters to 1.5 millimeters. His results show that, the, that over industry standard dry cycles, tab cooled cell incurred a smaller temperature gradient than its surface cooled counterpart. Yan concluded, that tab cooling is achievable even in large power cells. And I hope this adds strength to the argument for tab cooling. Tab cooling can be enhanced by thickening the tabs of any cell. And the thicker electrode stack benefits tab cooling because it increases the cross-sectional area through which heat can be removed. Therefore, tab cooling is theoretically unlimited by cell thickness. This is great for the mod modular prismatic cell designs that are beginning to dominate the R&D presentations at conferences in 2020. Surface cooling, meanwhile, is limited by cell thickness. Temperature gradients are inevitable and unavoidable. Surface cooling is fundamentally flawed. There is no escape from the problem whilst it remains a dominant thermal management technology. We will continue to see very large and very thin power cells cooled through a single surface. Every cell will have a ceiling on its lifetime which will not be breached until the inherent temperature gradients are somehow reduced or eliminated. We strongly believe that tab cooling can be the answer. Yes, it throws up complications of actually implementing thermal management onto the cell because the tabs are also required for the cell's electrical connections. However, the industry is expected to triple this decade and grow 10,000% in the coming 30 years. So it's something that's worth getting right now. 
There's no downside to trying to solve this problem. The incremental advances in cell chemistry, which are being worked on around on the all around the world, can continue to trickle down to the end user, regardless of how thermal management strategy is implemented in the pack. The left hand side featured earlier in the presentation, it shows that with lack of communication along the tiers of the battery industry, we're never going to reach optimal thermal management. Our ambition is to use a cell cooling coefficient as the tool for communication within industry. Thermal management quantified, it can no longer be ignored in favor of energy density optimization at the cell level. A cell designed to be thermally managed will have a slightly lower energy density, but this can be made up many times over at the pack level. A cell designed to be thermally managed will incur smaller temperature gradients and this will reduce degradation rate. Thank you very much for listening today. A big thank you to all my colleagues in the ESC group at Imperial College London. Specifically, I would like to thank those who I worked directly on what I've presented, Dr. Laura Bralo Diaz, Razim Mazouk, Dr. Yan Zhao, Ryan Prosser, Gavin White, and Dr. Laura Lander, as well as my supervisors, Dr. Yash Patel and Dr. Greg Offer. I look forward to taking any questions. Thanks. That was great, Alistair. Thank you very much for that. And just a reminder to everyone that you can submit your questions um, in the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and there are a couple of questions in there now, so I'll, I'll hand back over to, uh, to Alistair for those. OK, thank you. I'm just looking at the questions. OK, so first um, question from Mo, uh, who says, thanks for the talk. What role do you think the thermal changes caused by electromaterial degradation and phase transition play in battery thermal management? How does that influence cell and pack design? So um, firstly, I would say that I think the uh, degradation of the materials will affect the thermal performance of the cell. Um, it will affect surface cooling probably more than tab cooling. Uh, with tab cooling, the vast majority of the heat in the cell is rejected along the current collective, the aluminium and the copper, which will incur less uh, degradation over the course of a cell's lifetime than the active material and the electrolyte. With surface cooling, the heat rest may be removed through every single one of these materials, and therefore you're likely to see a larger change to the um, surface thermal performance. I don't have the information um, on quanti to quantify that or to even back my hypotheses. It is work that is ongoing at present in our lab. Um, we're, as soon as we're able to run tests, cell cooling coefficient tests on degraded cells, the cells are degrading at the moment, um, we will be able to um, to answer this more thoroughly and it will probably be the focus of a piece of work in the next 18 months. So Kieran says, how do these cylindrical cells compare to power cells for the cooling coefficient? Are there other thermal parameters that have to be considered when designing the thermal management system? OK, so uh, the first question, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so I focused on power cells today because uh, we don't have to get stuck into polar coordinates. Uh, they're probably the simplest to understand a the concept. They're also the simplest to in instrument and um, reliably determine the point at which the hottest, the hottest point on the cell would occur, which is why we initially focused on publishing work, cell cooling coefficient on the power cell. Um, my colleague, um, Sim Marzouk, is now focusing full time on uh, cylindrical cells and their thermal performance. Um, I had a chat with him yesterday about plans for upcoming publications. And so, um, Kieran, I'm very happy to uh, pass you on to my colleague. If you'd like, I don't know how best to share that information, um, but maybe through the chat here. Or um, alternatively, um, we we can discuss it another time. Um, cylindrical cells are most often called through well, they they can be called through their base. They can be called through their base and their 
um, cap, or they can be cooled through their cans. And in each case, the t highest temperature of the cell is likely to be internal. And therefore, um, instrumented cells, um, with thermocouples or similar inside, are absolutely essential. We believe that cylindrical cells can have quite good thermal performance if they're designed well. Uh, there was a um, quite a well-publicized patent uh, from Tesla a few weeks ago, uh, which effectively shows a cylindrical cell with tabs the length of the jelly roll. And that should, in theory, have a massive benefit to the, the thermal performance because you didn't have a much better uh, heat rejection pathway through to the base of the cell. Uh, another colleague of mine, um, Dr. Shen Li, uh, has a paper in preparation at the moment, which I believe will be um, submitted um, to Electrochemical Society Journal in the next few weeks. And so also be very happy to share that with you. And that is investigating how thermal performance is affected when you change the design of the tabs from what I'm aware. Uh, regarding Kieran's second question, are there other thermal parameters that have to be considered when designing the thermal management system? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so we have so far have focused on the point from which heat is generated inside the cell until the point at which it leaves the cell. So all of our apparatus, for example, is designed um, using conductive um, cooling plates, uh, whereas in application you would use a, um, a liquid cooling system, either through immersion cooling, direct cooling, or through indirect cooling, or perhaps you would use air cooling, and therefore you in each of these cases, you would have to consider um, the fluid, fluid properties of the set of your coolant and how the um, how the viscosity and the thermal boundary layer and the mass boundary layer on the surface that you're cooling is affected by those fluid properties and therefore what your convective heat transfer coefficient is. Um, that is work that is also ongoing for us. Um, and what we are intending to do is to try to extrapolate a little bit from our current cell cooling coefficient and start to um, publish our ideas on a system level so cooling coefficient. So where you can sum up all of the different sections of a battery thermal management system from the cell to the coolant, to the um, heat rejection from the uh, battery pack altogether. Um, and so all of them need to be considered. Um, another question from Mo. Did you find degradation rate caused by surface and tab cooling to be related with different battery systems, uh, such as solid state aqueous battery composition? Um, I don't, I haven't investigated um, away from NMC lithium ion cells. So I couldn't answer that with any degree of certainty. I'm sorry, I'm very happy to. Um, discuss offline um, uh, with uh, your question and, and what, you're, what you're leading towards. Um, and it potentially could be something that would be an interesting investigation for us in the future. Um, our group as a whole does do work with solid state cells, um, thermal based work with solid state cells. And so I would be very happy to pass you on to um, the PhD student most appropriate to discuss this with you. Uh, Tom Butler. Do you anticipate the cell cooling coefficient to be produced for immersion cooling as well, um, or for just tab and surface cooling individually? Okay, yes. Yeah, so um, the work that I have uh, in preparation at the moment, which um, I plan to publish uh, later on this summer, um, once it goes to the journal review, is uh, we firstly we looked at the different tab thicknesses, which is what I showed today. We also looked at the benefits of um, what I've called two-sided surface cooling, but in reality is probably quite similar to immersion cooling or perfect immersion cooling. Um, and so, yes, absolutely, we're fully intending to use the cell cooling coefficient in that respect. Um, the other thing with immersion cooling is immersion cooling doesn't necessarily mean that you completely envelope the cell uh, if you're running a lab test and you were trying to cool the cell as much as possible, you would um, put the cell in a very large um, container full of immersion liquid. In a battery pack, it may be that only part of the cell was immersed. And that is also work that my colleague uh, Wasim Masip is beginning 
um, looking at just partial immersion and seeing how that will affect the cell cooling coefficient. So, for example, if a cylindrical cell is only immersed around 50% of its can surface, or if immersed through um, just halfway through along its length. If there are no further questions, and then I'll just say thank you very much to Alistair for, for joining us today and for his excellent presentation, really clear and, um, and lucid uh, presentation, and, and to everyone who joined us today for, um, for watching and for submitting questions. Um, Alistair, perhaps you could let uh, people know how to get in touch with you. Uh, yep, yeah, absolutely. Uh, my email is uh, a.hales at imperial.ac.uk. Uh, oh, I've realised there is a way of... Um, and further to this, uh, we have a Nature Comments article that will be coming out um, in the next two or three weeks which will, um, I, I believe, uh, the Energy Futures Lab will uh, publish on their Twitter and so forth. Um, so um, highly recommend you take a read of that. Uh, there'll be a second video to go alongside it. Um, and uh, if anyone would like any more information about anything I've talked about today, please drop me an email and I can also keep you informed about the um, our group's uh, ongoing work in thermal management areas. Um, there's a final question. Um, there's a final question from Anonymous. Uh, are there any industry standards for thermal characterization of batteries and what do they do? Um, there are, it's a difficult thing to say. There is no industry standard because there is no, people use a number of common methods. Yeah. People aren't just completely ignoring the fact that temperature is a fundamental thing that affects every aspect of lithium mine cell operation. What they're doing is a number of different things. So you might see people talk about thermal conductance, uh, where they're looking at uh, what well, that's it. It's the same unit as the cell cooling coefficient. It's watts per Kelvin, but thermal conductance is devised to tell you how heat transfers from one uh, point in a body to another, rather than um, tell you how heat is rejected from the body that is generating heat throughout. Uh, it is also dimensionally needs to, to be, uh, needs to consider the geometry, whereas the cell cooling coefficient doesn't. Um, the BO number is something similar. Again, it's borrowed from another area of engineering. It is, um, as before, it considers heat transfer from one plane to another and heat rejection from an external surface. Therefore, it requires knowledge of the surrounding thermal management system, which isn't guaranteed to be known and shouldn't be, isn't universal. It would be specific to a given application. The cell cooling coefficient, we hope, tackles these two problems. Um, it, because it is empirically derived from a cell generating its own heat, we are intrinsically generating heat throughout the volume of the cell rather than just passing heat from one surface to another, which is good. And um, we also use the conductive uh, heat transfer from whichever our cooled surface is, uh, and that is not a thermal bottleneck, that's not a limiting factor, that is just allowing heat to transfer through. If there is a degree of um, temperature drop across that interface, that's no problem, it doesn't affect our measurement because we are measuring only cell temperatures and only heat rejection rates. And so that's how we try to tackle the problem. Um, I hope that answers the question. Uh, yeah, the reality is that people use metrics that are kind of common across all of engineering which but they do not work uh, in our opinion uh, for lithium mine cells super well thanks again alistair and and just to let people know that the alistair's uh, email address is there in the in the q a box um, if you'd like to to contact him a reminder that our, our series continues uh, next week. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Piera Patrizio from the Center for Environmental Policy. Her work focuses on connecting insights from energy modeling uh, with social science and energy um, or climate policy. The webinar is entitled Socially Equitable Energy Systems Transitions. So that's uh, next week at the same time, Thursday at 12 o'clock. Until then, uh, thanks again to Alistair and to thanks, thanks to all of you uh, for joining us um, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye bye.